about genealogy and looking up your ancestors. We call this digging up your ancestors because that's basically what you're doing. We're going to have Amy, who is our genealogy librarian, go over some of the places that you can go to in order to find out the people that came before you. I am Kathy Hale. I am the supervisor for public services at the State Library of Pennsylvania. Between Amy and I, we have been working at genealogy with other people for many, many years. We, we won't embarrass ourselves by saying how many. <laughs> so we do ask again that you keep your video and audio off because of the number of people that are on. We are asking that people do not ask questions during this time period. You'll see on the bottom of your screen, there is an email for the State Library library at ra-reflive at pa.gov. You can email us there. Somebody looks at that every day. And so we will try and ask, answer your questions. We don't know everything. I'm sorry to disappoint everybody, but we don't. But we know a lot of people. So even if we don't know the answer, sometimes we can point you to different places that you can go to for information. So thank you all for coming today. We really appreciate you being part of this. And now I'm gonna hand it over to Amy Watovich, our genealogy librarian. Go ahead, Amy. Hello everyone. Um, I, my name is Amy Watovich. I'm the genealogy and local history librarian at the State Library, like Kathy mentioned. And recently we've had a lot of interest in people searching our genealogy collection, especially since COVID has limited people's abilities to go out and do other things. So today I just wanna to try to give you a, a few tips about searching for your family history. With the libraries and the archives maybe cl um, closed right now or limited in hours, you're gonna to have to try to rely on internet resources to find your family history information. So I'm going to try to show you some places you can search on the internet for genealogy information besides using a database like Ancestry. Um, when you're first starting doing your research in your family history, one of the first things you want to do is go around your house and gather up all of the papers and documents you can find um, together in one place. These papers give you a lot of information about vital records like dates, of, uh, dates and places of births, marriages and deaths, but they can also give you some clues and information about a person's life and where they lived as well. For example, a death certificate in Pennsylvania will list a person's, the date of their death and their cause of death and the location they died, but they'll also list their home address, they'll list their spouse's names, their birth date, they may list the names and birthplaces of their parents. Um, they'll list the person's occupation and where the person was buried as well. So before you even begin doing your research, you wanna go through your house and you wanna look for things like birth and death certificates. Um, you wanna look for wedding announcements, high school graduation announcements, obituary clippings that you have, anniversary announcements, retirement announcements, old family photographs and family Bibles. Once you have these things all together in one place, I recommend you try to make digital copies of the originals if possible, or at least a photocopy. If you don't have access to a photocopier or a scanner, you can always try to take a picture of them with your camera or with a smartphone camera. Um, this is so you don't risk losing or damaging your originals while you're doing your research. You can use the copies instead. It also, I would also recommend letting storing your copies in a separate location, uh, like maybe letting another family member keep those copies or um, uploading them to the internet. If you do decide to store your copies online by uploading to them to the internet, uh, you wanna go through them and make sure that, uh, be very careful there's no personal identifying information like birth dates or social security numbers of living people on them just to protect people from identity theft. Once all your records together are together, you wanna go through them and organize all the information to see what you already know about your family history. 
most of the time people either use an online software or you can use paper ch um, charts and forms to track your family history. There are several places on the internet that you can download these forms for free. Ancestry, um, Family Search, and Heritage Quest, they all have paper forms available. And the National Archives website also has a, a whole web page with um, all of their genealogy um, charts and forms on it that you can download for free there as well. The most common form that people are going to use when they track their family history is the ancestry chart or family tree. This is the traditional family tree that everyone's used to seeing. It starts with yourself and it works backwards in time through each generation of your family. Um, there's also a form called a family group sheet. This is different from the family tree because it only tracks one family unit on your family tree. It's going to have more details about individuals in your family, but it's only going to track that, that one family unit. Okay, Amy, I'm going to jump in here and say that if you could go back one slide to the single sure sheet. <laughs> Let me see. Or even just, you can keep it there. To this okay. slide? To, yes, to the ancestral sheet. Make sure you make a lot of blank copies of this. And we usually tell people to write things in pencil because you are going to be adding a lot of things on this chart. Also, for each chart, do one side of the family. So one will be for a father's side or a mother's side. So depending on which side of the family you're trying to do and where it says chart number, it really helps if you actually number the pages because as we have found, many people have the same names depending on the ethnicity. So there like, might be lots of Marys or Patricks or Johns that are in your family and trying to keep everybody straight. So we usually try and tell people to have at least a number of blank copies when you're doing this and to put them in notebooks and have a notebook for each side of the family. Thanks, Amy. Okay. Uh, this was the family group sheet. There's also forms online that you can use for research logs. Um, you, if you're planning to write your family history after you do your genealogy research, I recommend you use a log to track all of the citations for where you found your records, because it will be easier to keep track of them while you're doing your research instead of going back and retracing your steps afterwards. Um, there are research logs and citation logs online that you can use and just fill in the blanks, but you could also use just a notebook and a pencil if you want. The important thing is to pick a system that works for you and you're going to stick with using it consistently. Um, when all of your papers are together, you want to start by writing down everything you already know about your family history and filling in all the blanks on those forms. And one thing that you might find helpful also is to create a timeline for each ancestor in your family. A timeline create uh, lists all the major life events for each person in your family. You want to start with one side of your family and go through them person by person um, and write down all the major events, that, um, dates and events that you can remember for them. It's usually easiest you start with yourself or your parents and then work backwards because you're going to have more information about more recent generations of your family. You want to list things like birth and death dates, um, the birth dates of children, marriages, military services, and things like that. And doing this will put all of those events in a chronological order for you. And after you've completed one side of your family, go over to the other side of your family and repeat the process again. You can do these timelines with pencil and paper. You might find it easier to use a computer like Word or Excel or Google Sheets on the computer. Um, if you use a computer, it does have the advantage of as you find information, you can go back and add it into your timeline without having to rewrite the entire timeline. And you should try to create a timeline for each person in your family. It can just, it'll just give you a quick overview of their life. And it also can point out uh, pieces of information that you're missing and you need to find. This is just an example of a timeline I created for my grandfather using Google Sheets. It lists his um, date of birth, the date he, dates he graduated from school, his marriage dates, um, the births of his children, and his date of death, and things like that. A lot of this information that is on your timeline, you can also find on your family group sheet. It just puts it in a different chronological order, and it focuses only on one person instead of on an entire family unit. 
And when you have all of these forms and timelines filled out, you're going to have a lot of papers and you're going to want to find an organization system for them. A lot of people just use a big three ring binder that they've divided into tabs and sections with a section for each family name. Um, you can use file folders in a file drawer. You can use pocket folders. I recommend you make copies of your files again and keep them backed up somewhere. Um, you can scan items and upload them to a cloud drive like Google Drive. Um, keeping a backup on a cloud drive can be helpful because you can access those files from anywhere using your laptop or smartphone. You don't have to drag your paper files with you. If you do decide to back up online, I want to remind you again to be careful what you upload about living people. After you've gathered as much information as you can from the papers you found and you've recorded and organized all of your information, it's a good idea to go talk to the older members of your family. Uh, especially um, especially the older generation about your family history. Um, you want to go to them and ask them open-ended in, uh, questions about their life so they can give you more information um, that you maybe you have. They might be able to give you a clue of information that you're looking for or they can fill in blank pieces of information for you. You ask them open-ended questions like who their other family members were, where they live, where they went to school, what occupation or job did they have, uh, what occupation or job did their parents or grandparents have, how they met their spouses, any type of family stories about your family histories you want to ask them about. Once you have all of your information together, it's also a good idea to go over it and look and see what types of uh, what types of sources you're getting your information from. There's four basic types of sources for you to, uh, that you'll probably need to know about. The first is a primary source. This is a record that was created at the time that the event happened. It was created by a person who was there and witnessed the event. It's going to provide you with direct evidence about the event. An example of a primary source is something like a birth certificate that was signed by the doctor who attended the birth. A secondary source is created after the event happened by someone who was not there. This, the person who's creating the source is using information that they get, um, gained from other people about the event. They're providing you with indirect evidence of it. These are things like obituaries that are written by someone or a family history. Um, you're also, sources can be either original or derivative. An original source is something like a birth certificate or a death certificate. It's issued originally from the state and it provides direct evidence of that event, like a birth certificate. A derivative source is created after the event happened. Um, there are things like family Bible records. If there's a county index of um, births that happened in the county, that index was created from the birth certificates that were um, created originally. So the index itself is a derivative source. If you have a primary source like a birth certificate, that's something you can consider a direct evidence of a fact. A secondary source like a birth date and an obituary, that's secondary information and you need to verify it with information from somewhere else. And one other thing to consider about your information sources, Sometimes your source of um, your document can be a source of both primary and secondary information. For example, a death certificate is going to be primary information for the date of the person's death. But, uh, they have also included the, uh, the date of the person's birth or the place of birth for the person. That's considered secondary information because that death certificate was not created at the time of the um, person's birth. When you've done all this and you've organized all your information and um, now is the time you want to decide what information you're going to look for and then make a plan for doing your research. It's best to approach your genealogy research by looking for small chunks of information at a time. You want to narrow down your search to searching something for something like a birth date for an ancestor or searching for a marriage record as opposed to go, just going online and typing in your last name and finding everything you can about your family because that's going to be more disorganized. Um, this is also when it's helpful when you're making your research plans to go back and use your research log form. When you're researching, you're going to want to keep track of what information you found and where. The research log form will list where you were searching, the search terms you used, and what results you found. And it's a good idea to write down those results, even if your search turned up nothing, because then you're not going to keep doing the same search over and over again because you've forgotten you did it before and spin your wheels and just keep turning up nothing over and over again. The research log, well, you can also go back and look at it and see which what you can search differently. Like maybe you want to use a different database. Maybe you want to do different search terms, like use a different spelling of the person's last name, or maybe use a different first name when they're searching. 
And also when you're searching, when you decide to start searching, it's hard, it's helpful to go back and look at the timeline that you created for your ancestor, because you want to see which records are going to be available during that ancestor's lifetime. If you're looking for birth information for an ancestor that was born in 1860, it's no use looking in a birth certificate database. Birth certificates and death certificates weren't created and or weren't Weren't start, didn't start being issued until much later in time. So you're gonna to have to go look in places like church baptism records and family Bible records or newspaper announcements for that information because there's not gonna be an official record that exists. The other thing you wanna think about is geography because geography has changed, especially in Pennsylvania and other states over time. So that someone that you think might be born in a county out in Western Pennsylvania may not have been a county at that time. Or if you have someone that's very early in the 1700s, some of the counties in Pennsylvania grew quickly that Chester, Lancaster and Bucks and Berks County. So make sure that if you can't find it in the one that you think it's going to be, think historically what the actual governmental entity was at the time. Okay, there's a lot of genealogy databases out on the internet. Um, most people know about Ancestry and there will be a few things that you can still do for free on Ancestry. If you, if you create an account, like create a family tree, um, you'll still be able to access Pennsylvania birth and death certificate databases, but you'll have to go through the Pennsylvania Historical and Museum Commission's website instead and use their um, Ancestry Pennsylvania database. On Ancestry, you can also look at the card catalog to see what databases they offer. It's best to try to look at Ancestry's card catalog by Googling Ancestry and card catalog because Ancestry is always changing their um, web page, their home page, because they want to advertise their products and um, their paid subscriptions. So you may be able to find the card catalog one day by just navigating to it, but they might um, have put an ad there or something the next. If you look in their card catalog and there's a database that they do offer for free, it is usually marked as free in the card catalog. One other thing that Ancestry has is a free index collections page and they have a search screen at the top of the screen and you can type in all your information there, but it's going to search all of the free data collections that they have. They do have a link on the right side at the top of the page that it's called view all collections and that will take you down to a list of the data collections they have and you can search through that list to find a database that's specific to your um, search like if you want to look for Pennsylvania birth certificates you can look for a Pennsylvania database um, if you do search this way on ancestry you can see that you've turned up results if you want to actually look at the results you're going to have to use an ancestry account another place that you can go to um, on uh, for genealogy research on the internet is family search. There are some smaller databases too, like Find My Past. Most of the small databases, you're gonna to have to pay to access at least some of the, uh, the information on them. Family search is one database that you can create an account and use it totally for free. You can upload, um, you can upload your own family history information and create your family tree and store your records on there. They have records that you can search. They have online genealogies that have been uploaded by other users. And they also have a digital library that has a lot of items in it, that have been, um, like family histories and county histories that have been digitized and you can access those for free. At the State Library's website in our For General Public section, you can find research guides for different genealogy topics as well as uh, links to other places to look for genealogy information. We also have a website or webpage that lists all the county historical societies. So if you do decide you want to go out and do some research in person, um, you can look for their contact information there. One of the most important things that people search for when they're doing genealogy research is vital records. Vital records are usually kept by the government. They're considered a primary source of information. You can find Pennsylvania birth and death certificate information at the Pennsylvania Historical and Museum Commission's website using their Ancestry Pennsylvania database. In Pennsylvania, to protect people's privacy and identities, birth and death certificate information isn't released until a specific time period is passed. You have to wait 50 years for death certificate information and 105 years for birth certificate information. So right now, the birth certificates that are included in the Ancestry Pennsylvania database are from 1906 to 1915. The death certificates that are included are from 1906 to 1970. If you want, um, 
rec if you need records before 1906, you can try the county archives, the county uh, courthouse to see if they were uh, collecting that information before 1906. But you may have to go to the County Historical Society and look in things like church records. If you want more recent birth and death records, these are kept by the Pennsylvania Department of Health's Division of Records. The Pennsylvania Department of Health will only release this information to you if it's for a record for yourself or if it was a record of someone who is directly related to you like a child or a parent or a grandparent. Uh, marriage records in Pennsylvania have been, have been kept at the county level since 1885. Um, so you will probably have to go to the county courthouse where the couple was married in order to find any marriage certificate information for them. We do have a list of Pennsylvania County courthouses at the State Library's website in our for general public section in the genealogy section. And the Pennsylvania Unified Judicial System is another place you can go. They have a list of county courthouses with their contact information on them. If you can't find their marriage record in the county courthouses, you're probably going to have to go to the County Historical Society and look for church records. If you're looking for adoption records, you're going to need to contact the county courthouse where the adoption occurred. In Pennsylvania, there are some strict laws about what adoption information can be released and to whom. One place to go to for an overview of the whole process is the statewide adoption and permanency network. They have a search and reunion page and they, uh, they can give you um, information about what forms you need to fill out and that type of thing. If you're looking for older adoption records, if you uh, for like pre-1900, you're probably going to have to go to the county courthouse again where the adoption occurred and look at probate or guardianship records. If there's nothing there, you can try to um, look in your county historical society and look for things like church records or maybe maternity home records. Um, another place to look for uh, information about Pennsylvania adoption, uh, doing a Pennsylvania adoption research, uh, FamilySearch does have an online wiki about doing adoption research in Pennsylvania. If you can't find any of your vital records um, using this information, uh, you're probably going to have to go to uh, secondary sources like obituaries, birth announcements, newspaper articles. Um, there's, you have to check family Bible records. A lot of times you can find family Bible records in local historical societies or archives. Find a grave and billion graves also has um, some birth and death date information on it. If you're looking for a veterans information, you can try to check the National Cemetery Administration. They have veterans burial information in their grave locator database. The census is one of the most popular things that people search. A lot of times this is where people start when they're researching their family history. You can search the census at the National Archives. Uh, family Search, which is free, also has census records available on it. And you can also find census records in Ancestry and Heritage Quest databases. Census records are not released for 72 years. So the census records are, that are available right now are from 1790 to 1940. The 1940 census was not released in print or on microfilm. So you're not gonna be able to go to a library and search it on microfilm like you did in the past. If you wanna search the 1940 census, you have to use one of the internet sites for it. The 1950 census is scheduled to be released on April 1st, 2022. So if you wanna search the 1950 census, there's just like a little over a year's wait for that. Um, the census records can provide a lot of information about a person's life. Life they list it, they list the names of the uh, person, their family members, and their children. Depending on the year of the census, they can provide information about a person's age, the date of their marriage, their occupations, um, the date of their, their immigration and naturalization, where the person and their parents were born, um, sometimes their education level, sometimes there was questions about their property, whether they owned their own property, and things like that. The questions changed, the questions that they asked changed every time there was a census. The final questions to be included were decided on, were de to decided with each census, depending on what information government officials thought they were going to need. So the information that you can find about your ancestor is gonna vary on each census. Um, there is, the National Archives has a web page on their charts and form page that has all the uh, blank census forms available and so you can look at the questions there and the US the US Census Bureau also has a page with an index of questions and this lists every question that was ever asked on every census um, so just it, depends, for it, it depends on the census that you're looking at the first census only had the name of the head of household 
that had to be a male over the age of 18, sometimes, especially in the early census, because women could not pay taxes. It may just have that there's one or two females. Uh, they also include information if someone was living with the person who's not related. So you might see the word border that someone was renting space from a person. So not everybody is going to have a name attached to them in each of the censuses. Thanks, Amy. Oh, sure. Uh, just for an example of the information you can find about a single person on the censuses, these are the three censuses that my grandfather was listed on. Um, there's 1910, 1920, and 1930. In the 1910 census, um, he he's listed with a different spelling of his last name. He was married to another woman before my grandmother, and her name is listed. His place of birth and his parents' place of birth is Austria. He spoke Polish and English. He could read and write, and he was the landlord of a saloon. In 1920, the census records say that he arrived in the U.S. in 1900, and he was naturalized in 1906. The place of birth for him and his parents was Austria, and they spoke Polish. Uh, my grandfather or my grandmother is listed as his wife this time. Um, he was employed as a hotel keeper in 1920. On the 1930 census, they asked a lot of more detailed questions. Um, there, it was expanded. And the census states that he owned his own home. He had a radio. His place of birth is Austria. His native language is Ukrainian this time. His citizenship answers have been crossed out and written over, but it states that he was not naturalized in 1930. And his occupation is listed as a grocery merchant. So this is just an example of the information that you can find on the census and the information you can track about a person over their lifetime if you use the census. Um, you can also use the census information to narrow your search in other areas. For example, the birth information is not just for the person listed on the census, it's also for the, um, his parents. So if you're looking for birth information about grandparents, you can narrow down your geographic area by looking at the census to see where they were listed as being born. You can use the immigration uh, naturalization dates and the arrival dates in the US to help your search for immigration records. You can also use the census information to double check whether records you've already found are correct. Um, for example, I have a passenger list also for my grandfather from when he arrived in 1900. It's the same year that is listed in the census. When my aunt found the passenger list in the National Archives, I don't have any other proof that this is the correct passenger list for him other than it sort of matches up with some things that we were told about his family. On family search, I did find citizenship papers for someone with the same name and living in the same town but the arrival date is different. So now I know because the census list and the census and the passenger list list one date, I have to go back and look at those citizenship papers again to see if I can fit, find citizenship papers for someone else with the same name. If you have trouble locating your ancestor on the census, you can check if the city directory is available for the town you lived in. You can use the city directory to make sure that was actually living there because sometimes people were living in different locations for work purposes and they may have been counted there and you can also look and see if he was spelling his name the same way he might have been spelling it differently or using a different name um, first name city directories are address by address listings of people who live within a certain area many of them were done for major metropolitan areas uh, say so they're one is one for Harrisburg or one for Scranton. It might be over a whole geographic area, for example, York County, but usually they were done according to a specific smaller city or larger city within a geographic area. Another thing I wanna add is spelling was not homogenized until the mid 1900s. So, don't be afraid to look at various spellings of your name. <laughs> I can vouch for that yeah. <laughs> personally. <Yeah. laughs> if you are looking for military records, Bold3 is a subscription database and it has mostly military records on it. One thing it does have on it is the Pennsylvania Published Archives. These are uh, records for the colonial and revolutionary areas in Pennsylvania. So they have colonial and revolutionary era military records, but they also have it also has in it things like ships passenger lists, tax lists. There are lists of marriages that occurred in Pennsylvania. There are accounts from Pennsylvania settlers about dealing with Indians during French and Indian War. 
So there's a lot of different information in it. You can find the Pennsylvania Published Archives and Ancestry, um, but you'll have to search it through the main search screen. If you try to go through it through the card catalog, you can only browse it. And it's an extremely large document. It's not really browsable. If you try to access it through Fold3, it is listed as a free database in Fold3. Another good place to look for military information is the National Archives. It's a good place to go to for um, service records and pension records. To get a pension for early wars like the Revolutionary War, the Civil War, veterans and their widows had to apply to the government and they had to provide the government with proof that they qualified for that pension. So those uh, applications can give you a lot of information like marriage dates and spouses names and um, names and birth dates of children, affidavits of veteran services and injuries, as well as just listing the dates and places of military service. The National Park Service also has uh, something called the Soldiers and Sailors Database. This will give you names of men who served in both the Union and Confederate armies during the Civil War. And another place that you can search for military record information is the United States serial set. Um, you can find it at the Library of Congress's website. It contains the documents and reports of Congress and it's arranged by um, each congressional session, but you can look in it and find things like claims against the government, um, military registers, pension reports. Um, you can find DAR reports and information about land grants. Newspapers can give you a, a lot of information about a person's life that you're not going to find in official records. For example, obituaries will include organizations that the person belonged to, their occupation, their hobbies. Um, they can include the church memberships, names of their extended ma family members. Sometimes they even include names of pets in obituaries. Uh, many times anniversary announcements will include biographical information of the couple and these were published in the newspaper. Uh, the town, I know the town newspaper where my grandparents live published little articles about who attended social gatherings and parties which people held that can give you names of other relatives and neighbors. Um, for example, the smaller clipping in the front here is from a 1913 edition of the Altoona Mirror. It's about my grandmother's 16th birthday party and it lists the friends of the neighbors and, and neighbors who attended including the name of my grandfather and the name that my grandmother's sister um, eventually married. So you might find future relatives also listed in these articles. And one way you can use these articles with the names of neighbors in them is if you can't find your ancestor on the census, if you know the name of a neighbor, you can search for the neighbor and find the neighbor on the census. And then you can browse back and forth in the census records to see all of the people who were living nearby him and you may be able to find your ancestor that way. You can also use the newspaper articles as prompts to go back and re-interview your family members. Um, for example, I have another clipping that's very similar about a party that my great grandparents held. And in the middle of the list of the neighbors that attended this party, they mentioned that one of their neighbors named Hugh fell off the roof during the middle of the party. The newspaper article doesn't men mention why he was on the roof or how badly Hugh was injured. So if they were still alive today, I could go to them with this article and say, you know, tell me about this. And they may be able to provide you with more information about your family that you didn't have before you can sort of refresh their memory. Um, the other newspaper here is a front page of a newspaper that's in our microfilm collection. Our physical collection is still closed because of COVID, but we do have several electronic databases of newspapers that we can also look for you. Um, if you need to find an article or an obituary, all you need to do is email us at the State Library. Okay, that has changed a little bit that we have opened up our interlibrary loan a little bit more for the uh, sending out of newspaper microfilm to libraries throughout the country. You just want to be careful, depending on the library that you're using, whether it is open to you to be able to go in and use the equipment and that they have equipment to use the uh, microfilm reader, perhaps a printer. We will lend up to five reels of microfilm per request and a reel of microfilm is a, about a month's worth of a newspaper depending on how big and how frequently the newspaper was published. There's also a few sites on the internet that have digitized older newspapers and they're available for free. Uh, the biggest is probably Chronicling America. It's from the Library of Congress. It has digital copies of newspapers from all over the United States from 1789 to 1963. 
There's a site in Pennsylvania called the Pennsylvania Newspaper Project. It's from the Pennsylvania State University and they've digitized a lot of smaller town and college newspapers. So if you're looking for a small town newspaper, you might wanna check at the um, Pennsylvania Newspaper Project. There's the Google News Archive. This has historical back files of newspapers and magazines. It includes articles that are available for free and also some articles that you do have to have a subscription to the newspaper to access them, but um, you can check there. Those newspapers are not categorized by country or city. They're arranged alphabetically. So it's a good idea to have an idea of what the newspaper is called before you start looking there. There's a site called elephine.com. This also has historical newspapers from all over the world, and it includes some links to some state digital newspaper collections. If you get stuck and you're having trouble locating your ancestors records anywhere, it's a good idea to go check historical maps and atlases just to make sure that you're looking for those records in the right place. County and state boundaries changed a lot over time. Um, new counties were usually formed by uh, splitting off pieces of older counties like, um, for example, Lebanon County was created in 1813 by splitting off sections of Dauphin and Lancaster County. So if you had an ancestor that lived in the Lebanon County area before 1813, you don't want to look in the records for Lebanon County. You're going to have to look in records for um, Dolphin and Lancaster counties. Um, there were also changes to state boundary lines as disputes were settled between states about what territory belonged to what state. So depending on where and when and where your ancestor lived, you may have to check for those records in additional states. Another reason to look at maps and atlases is sometimes in obituaries and family histories, you're going to come across small communities or neighborhoods that no longer exist. And these can't be found on current maps. So many times if you go back and look at the maps that were created during your ancestors lifetime, you can find those places marked on those. Two good places to look for historical maps are the Library of Congress's historical maps collection. Also, the Newberry Library has an atlas of historical county boundaries. In addition to the maps on the Newberry Library's atlas, they also have a chronology of how each Pennsylvania county changed over time. Um, the, there's the Atlas of Historical Geography of the United States. This is at the University of Richmond and it has um, historical maps in it. Another good place to look for historical maps is the National Archives. The National Archives has things like census maps. They have maps that were used in land office records as well as military maps and charts. The National Archives also has information about searching ships passenger lists and immigration records. They have a lot of immigration information online as well as links to immigration records at both the Castle Garden and Ellis Island ports. Castle Garden was the um, port in New York City before Ellis Island and they have a link to the immigration records that they hold in their access to archival information database as well. Um, depending on when your ancestor arrived in the United States, uh, your immigration, their immigration records could have a, a lot of different information in them. They can tell you the nationality of your ancestor, the date he entered in the United States, uh, the name of the ship he came on. They may have a physical description of your ancestor, his place of last residence, and sometimes they include names and addresses of relatives that lived in the United States. Okay, just remember too that New York is not the only port of entry for immigration. Many people came in through Boston, Philadelphia, Baltimore, and Charleston. So it's just not New York. <laughs> Um, the immigration laws also changed in 1906. Uh, prior to September 1906, um, the Im immigration, any court of record could grant citizenship. So any court of record could have been a municipal, uh, a county, a uh, state or federal court. It wasn't list, uh, limited to federal jurisdiction. So if your an ancestor arrived prior to September 1906 or filed for naturalization prior to September 1906, you need to go to the county courthouse, probably where they were living because they probably would have gone to the closest um, courthouse available and look for the county records there. Um, it, you'll have to find out where those records are kept. Sometimes they're still stored in the county sometimes they were sent somewhere else for storage. You can also find some county immigration records in family search, um, but you're probably still going to have to contact the county courthouse. After September 1906, you'll need to look for the immigration records at the National Archives. And if they arrived after 1924, um, you'll have to contact the US Citizenship and Immigration Services. And both of these sites, the National Archives site and the US Citizenship and Immigration Services, they have a pretty detailed website to explain 
what time period, which time period you're looking at and where those records are being kept. If you are looking for a female ancestor, um, women were allowed to become naturalized citizens on their own. However, the way the judges interpreted citizenship laws, many women were granted derivative citizenship instead, uh, which tied their naturalization to their husbands. Sometimes they were listed on their husband's naturalization papers, sometimes they were not. Um, they may have simply used their husband's naturalization papers and their marriage certificate to prove their citizenship. If you have an ancestor who arrived in the United States as a child, children under 20, at the age of 21 were also granted derivative citizenship. They were considered citizens if their parents were naturalized, so there won't be separate naturalization papers for them. If their parent did not become naturalized or if their parent waited until after they were 21 to become naturalized, then that child would have to go through the citizenship process on his own and he would have his own naturalization papers then. County histories also um, are a good place to look for genealogy information. They can give you a lot of information about the area where your ancestor lived. They tend to have information not just about the county, but also smaller towns and townships. Um, they have histories uh, about, about churches that existed in the areas, and this can be useful if you need to find church records for um, marriage or birth dates information. It'll give you the names of the churches so you can try to uh, limit your, search, your record search. Many times they listed the families that were the early settlers in the area and told stories about the families. For example, this clipping is from the history of Lehigh County. It's about the Boyer family that lived in Lehigh Gap and they, the day they were out farming and they were attacked by Indians. The Indians killed the father and they took the children prisoner and took them to Canada. And it tells the story of the son's release from um, Canada and how he made his way back to Pennsylvania. To find county histories, you can look in our catalog at the State Library. Um, you just need to enter ca the county's name and history in the search fields. If there's an online version of that county history, there'll be a link in the catalog record that will take you directly to it. Uh, usually they're stored on one of a few different locations like Internet Archive, our Hathi Trust, or the PA Photos and Documents Collection and Power Library. You can also look in, families, in the Family Search Library. They have a digital library that has a lot of county histories that they've digitized, and you can access those for free. In the PA Photos and Documents collection, there are also some libraries and historical societies that have digitized high school yearbooks. So that's another place to go to find perhaps images of the people of your ancestry. Um, family histories and genealogies, um, these are basically family trees and summaries of research by other genealogists. These can be useful to use if you get stuck and you can't find the person or record. You can look at the research that someone else has, did to see what they found. The important thing is that like county histories, family histories are all secondary information. You need to verify that all the facts that you find in them to make sure that they're correct, especially if they're going to be based on things like Bible records or family interviews. A lot of times in a family interview, the person being interviewed may honestly believe a fact about that they've been remembered is correct, but they may, uh, it might be like an immigration date or a story, but they may have remembered that incorrectly or they may have been told incorrect information themselves to begin with. So anything you find in a family history, you should verify separately. To find family histories, um, like county histories, you can look in our catalog or you can look at um, Family Search and the PAs and Photos and Documents website at Power Library. The National Archives also has places, uh, a, a web page that lists places to look for information about different ethnic groups, including African American genealogy. Uh, for African American genealogy research, it includes links to sites like the Freedmen's Bureau, African American Cemeteries Online, and as well as links to articles and blogs about doing African American research. Um, the United States Colored Troop records are at the National Archives and they're available through Ancestry. Unless you have an Ancestry account, you'll probably have to access them through the card catalog. They have a link to Afrogeneous, which is a site that's solely dedicated to doing African American genealogy research. Um, they also have a link to the Freedmen's Bureau on their site. Um, the Freedmen's Bureau was created after the Civil War for relief efforts. So it's a good place to go and try to find marriage um, information or land record information. Another place you can look for African American genealogy research tips is Family Search. They have a wiki that's solely devoted to African American online genealogy records. 
If you're looking for a Native American ancestor, um, the Indian Citizenship Act granted a Native American citizenship in 1924. Before that, Native Americans were only counted on the general population census if they were living in the general population and they were taxed. <clears throat> Native Americans who were living on reservations or if they were living in unsettled areas of the countries and they were not taxed, then they were not counted on the census. There were some sporadic censuses that were taken of Native Americans. The first is the American Indian census rolls. These were completed annually from 1885 to 1940. They were not completed by the Census Bureau. They were completed by the superintendent in charge of Indian reservations and they submitted them to the Commissioner of Indian Affairs. The data that you're going to find on them is going to vary, especially in the beginning, because they didn't have standardized forms. Uh, but they usually you can the information on them will contain the English or Indian name of the person, their role number, um, the age or their their date of birth, their sex, and their relationship to the head of households. And only people who maintained a formal affiliation with their tribe are included in these roles. If you're looking for the 1940, those are not at the National Archives. You'll have to look at the records of the Bureau of Indian Affairs for the 1940 roles. One other place to look is on the 1900 and the 1910 census, there were special schedules um, used. Um, they were called the special inquiries relating to Indians. Sometimes they're called the Indian population schedules. These schedules enumerated um, Native Americans who were living on and off reservations. They asked the same questions that were on the general population schedules, but there is additional questions for Native American households on them. Another place to look, or the last place to look, is the there's something called the Dawes Rolls. Sometimes they're called the Final Rolls. The Dawes Rolls were lists of members of what were called at the time the Five Civilized Tribes. They were Cherokee, Creek, Choctaw, Chickasaw, and Seminole tribes were the ones that were included. The Dawes Rolls, Rolls were created because they were trying to maintain uh, create a list of the members of these tribes so they could give the members an allotment of land in exchange for giving up their tribal government. So these roles were created from 1898 to 1914. The thing about searching the Dawes roles, though, is you need to know your ancestor's tribe. So if you don't know your ancestor's tribe, you want to go back first to the, the Indian population schedules because it should be um, listed on those schedules. The other thing about searching the Dawes roles, as many times people were categories, categorized based on their mother's race, so to use them, you may have to retrace the female, your, the, the line of your female ancestors. These are just a few other sites you can go for Native American um, genealogy research. The National Archives site has quite a bit of uh, information on it about doing Native American genealogy research. They also have links to other sites in their archives library information center page. Family Search also has a Native American online genealogy records wiki on its on the internet for free that you can look at for more information. And they also have a site that's um, so, uh, focused on researching indigenous people of pe uh, indigenous peoples of Pennsylvania and their genealogy. At the National Archives, they also have a resources for genealogists page that you may want to check out if you're just beginning your research. Even if you've been researching for some time now, you'll probably find information on this. It'll be helpful. They have information about where to focus your search for certain genealogy records because these genealogy records are scattered, they're scattered all over the country. They're not solely located in one building in Washington, DC. Um, they also have articles and blogs um, entries that can explain why you can't find what you're looking for if you're, um, you're stuck in your genealogy research. One thing you want to look at on that page, they have a link to their digitization partners. This is going to tell you what records they've digitized and where to find them. Most of their digitized records are going to be available at Fold3 Ancestry or Family Search, but they do have some record collections that are um, housed at some smaller sites as well. And it will also tell you the level of completion they have for the digitization of each record collection. If you have kids that are home right now, an another site that you want to look at from the National Archives is their Genealogy Activities for Kids page. It has family trees that kids can create. There's also a link to educator resources for virtual and at-home learning. You can find things like online lesson plans for using primary source documents and family history activities. So if your kids are home right now because they can't go to school, you might wanna check out the National Archives resources to see if they have anything that might help you. 
Um, there's a few other sites with genealogy activities for kids as well. Uh, the US Census Bureau has a web page with home and distance learning activities. It includes videos about the census. It has activities for students and handouts with information about the census. American Ancestors is from the New England Historic and Geneal Historic Genealogical Society. They have a page with youth activities like scavenger hunt and creating family trees and as well as some craft projects like making ancestral keepsake ornaments. Um, family Tree Magazines is another place to go. Uh, they have articles about family history related activity. And at the Family History Technology Lab at Brigham Young University, they have a site called Genie Eperty. It is a family history Jeopardy game. You'll need to create a family search account and upload your family history to use it, but it will then create a Jeopardy game for you using your family history. It will create questions about your ancestors' lives, and it also has some more general information about your ancestor, about which ancestor lived during which historical era. If you're looking for digital documents, we have a large number of documents that we've digitized and made available at the PA Photos and Documents Collection at the Power Library website. You just need to go to powerlibrary.org and click on the PA, um, PA Photos and Documents Collection icon that's at the top of the page. And you can browse these documents by the subject of genealogy to see what all the participating institutions have um, digitized, or you can select a single institution like the State Library or State Archive to browse. Some of the things we've digitized are Harrisburg Newspaper Index. This is an index of marriages and deaths that were published in the local Harrisburg papers between 1799 and 1827. Um, this card is an example of an, uh, an index card. It's uh, an obituary information for Mrs. Frances Clark, who died in 1808, and her obituary was published in the Dolphin Guardian. We have a necrology scrapbook on the uh, uh, PA Photos and Documents site. It contains obituaries that were published between 1891 and 1904. If you're looking for some information about Civil War veterans, this might be a good place for you to come and look and see if you can find them there. We also have digital surname files. These are research that was done over the years by the State Library staff about for different surnames. There's a list of the surnames that are included in our um, genealogy pages in the resources for general public section, our websites, but you can find the actual files digitized um, on the PA Photos and Documents collection. It's in the genealogy collection for the State Library. We've also digitized a lot of family and local histories, including things like church histories. And there are a number of older Pennsylvania newspapers that have been digitized that we've digitized and put in the uh, PA photos and documents collection. This is an example. It's a, a front page of an Elk Enterprise newspaper from 1906. And this um, particular edition gives a uh, history of the town of St. Mary's. Its articles are dedicated to that. There are also regimental histories of Pennsylvania regiments during the Civil War, and there's a lot of digital copies of historical maps and atlases that we've digitized. Some of these historical map, uh, atlases, in addition to the maps, they also have illustrations of different sites in town, including homes of uh, prominent citizens or businesses. So they're very interesting to go through, and you may be able to find um, a, maybe an illustration of a, your, one of your ancestors' homes in them. This is just a few books. Um, they, these are a few genealogy books you could try to borrow from your public library if you want to do further research. They have some general information about doing genealogy research and how to use sites like Ancestry and Family Search. A lot of the information that is in these uh, books you can find on the internet, but it's going to be scattered across different websites. Um, if you do go out on the internet to uh, search, there are some geneal professional genealogists that have blogs that they do, um, they write and have research tips in them as well. This is a link to some other places online that you can look for free genealogy information. I mentioned Family Search before. Um, family Search is totally free to create an account, and you can search through their records and keep track of your family history there at no cost. Cindy's List is a site that has links to different databases. It's divided by subject area. Uh, the US Gen Web, pro Web Project is um, county and state resources. Its content is created by volunteers from different historical societies, so the information you find on it might vary depending on their level of participation. RootsWeb is owned by Ancestry, but it still has, you can still access some of the family trees and other genealogy information on it, as well as other genealogy projects. The National Archives has a lot of information on it about doing genealogy research. 
the Census Bureau also has a page for it of its that has um, uh, it explains doing genealogy research while using the census. The Library of Congress is a good place to look for genealogy information too. They have a page that has links to both their online and their print resources on their site. The New York Public Library is a good place to look for historical maps. There's also a library called the Allen County Public Library in Indiana. They have a very large genealogy center and on their website, you can find things like surname files and they have a gateway to doing African-American genealogy research and another gateway to doing Native American genealogy sources. So these were a few of the sites that you can find on the internet. If you stop by our website in our four general public section, we do have our genealogy resources guides that have a lot more links to different information that you can search for genealogy information on it as well. Um, if you have any questions about doing your genealogy research, you can always email us. Uh, we can try to help you out. Our um, email address is ra-reflib at pa.gov. Uh, Kathy, did you have anything you wanted to add? Yes, one thing you want to know the difference between is the State Library of Pennsylvania and the Pennsylvania State Archives. We are both under different jurisdictions. The Pennsylvania State Archives is under the Pennsylvania Historic and Museum Commission. They will have some different records than we have. They are the official recorders of the documents of the government. So if there are accident reports for railroads, that would be under the Department of Transportation. You can go on to the State Archives website. There are some ways that you can do some searching for that as well. Um, we are going to have some different things than that State Archives. So we are the State Library. We are under the Department of Education and Amy has our website right there and our email. Each of the persons who have registered for this webinar are going to get a copy of Amy's um, slideshow that she did, the PowerPoint that she did, and also we will send you a list of different electronic resources that were mentioned in here today so that you don't have to try and rack your brain as to, wait, what did she say about this? Again, we are here for you. That's one of our jobs is to answer information about people of Pennsylvania and the history of Pennsylvania. So we really want to thank Amy here today. She's done a lot of hard work in order to gather all this information together. I'm sure your mind is spinning with all of the places that she sent you to go. Again, email us at ra-reflib at pa.gov and we will do our best with the uh, ability that we have. We are going rent through renovations at our normal forum building address, but we are in a temporary spot and, and that is close to the public at this time. Make sure that you watch our website for when we will, will be open during the COVID-19 pandemic. We don't really know just yet, but watch our website and we'll have instructions on how you can come to visit us. And then in a couple years when we're back in our old home at the Forum building, then you will be able to come and see a brand new spanking new redone library and we will have all of our materials back that you can take a look at and search for your family history. Okay, Amy, anything else you want to add? Nope, that was everything. Thank you for joining us. <laughs> okay, thank you for joining us today. We do plan to continue to have webinars on genealogy and how to find your ancestors, maybe different ethnic groups that we can focus on. If you have suggestions of places that you'd like us to do webinars on, send it to that email as well. So thank you very much for joining us today and have a good day. Bye.